where Elizabeth Glinke has today's political talking points. Is there still a class ceiling in Britain? Are banks blacklisting customers for political reasons? And what can Joe Biden teach us about economics? This is Politics Live. With me today, the Conservative MP and former minister, Heather Wheeler. Labour's leader in the House of Lords, Angela Smith, author and co-host of the Trigonometry podcast, Constantine Kissin, and journalist and author, Paul Mason. On the programme. We want to break the link between where people start in life as children and young people and where they end up. The Labour leader says he'll smash Britain's so-called class ceiling. But does it really exist? Also today. Parliament Standards Watchdog recommends an eight-week suspension for the former Tory MP Chris Pincher over groping allegations. I got a phone call a couple of months ago to say, we are closing your accounts. I asked why, no reason was given. The City Minister orders a review of banking rules after Nigel Farage says his bank blacklisted him. So the contents have it. The government's illegal migration bill runs into trouble again in the House of Lords. This amendment is a positive and constructive suggestion, whatever I may feel or others may feel about the bill in general. And would Bidenomics be a good idea in Britain? Bidenomics is working. Today, the US has the highest economic growth rate, leading the world economies since the pandemic, the highest in the world. Hello, and we are going to start today with what the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, is talking about this morning. Let's have a look at this headline on the front page of The Sun. Sir Keir vows to smash the class ceiling. Uh, in his speech today, Keir Starmer will say there is a pervasive idea, a barrier in our collective minds that narrows our ambitions for working class children and says, sometimes with subtlety, sometimes in your face, this isn't for you. Some people call it the class ceiling, and that's a good name for it. Heather, does it exist? I don't think it does. And uh, certainly um, years ago, when there was a brilliant statistic that something like 40,000 children on free school meals, only 40 of them actually went to Oxbridge. Well, that's gone now. That's completely gone. So I, I think he's almost picking something just to, to have another headline. And it's a shame because um, at the moment, we've got so many more schools who are good under Ofsted than ever before. Um, we've got people who are choosing to go to university or choosing to have apprenticeships. You know, it, it isn't the whole thing there. And I think we need more people like that. So I, I just don't see it. I certainly don't see it in South Derbyshire. Angela. I think Helen's, Helen's got a bit of a rosy picture there. What this says is that everybody should be able to achieve their potential and the nation benefits from that as a whole. And there is no doubt that a number of children are held, held back in life because of where they start. If we don't make the most of the talents of everybody, we're not getting the benefit for the nation, we're not getting the benefit of making the most of those children. So this is music to my ears in so many ways. No one should be held back because the family income or where they live, everyone should have equal chances. You know, I've been told, I'm sure others have been told, well, don't think about that, you're directed in certain directions. We have to break away from that and open opportunities. So if we give the, every child that opportunity, it's got to be good for the family, it's got to be good for the child, and it's good for the nation as a whole. OK, Constantine, do you think the UK has a class ceiling? I don't think it's a class ceiling, but I do certainly think there's a class disadvantage. I mean, it's true in every country, if you're growing up poor, you're going to have lower life outcomes, which is one of the reasons I've been shouting for a long time that instead of importing American-style obsessions with ethnicity and so on, we should really be focusing on what actually deprives people of opportunity in the country, irrespective of their background, which is poverty and economic deprivation. And if you think about it, you know, if your, your father has a mate who's a judge, you're going to have an easier path into the law than someone who grows up in a council estate, hasn't seen many people from that profession in their life. So I think that's really important that we focus on it. Is Keir Starmer going to make the changes to education that are needed in order to get people from those backgrounds uh, the opportunities they deserve? I do wonder because, you know, I happen to live in a part of the country which has 
because still grammar school is the opportunity for kids from poor backgrounds to succeed in education. Is he going to talk about that? Is he going to talk about discipline in the classroom, excluding people who are disruptive to the classroom? Uh, we'll, we'll find out. One of the things he is talking about is improving uh, young people's speaking skills, which I guess is, Paul, something typically you hear about in public schools, in the big posh schools, they teach people how to speak and how to present themselves. He's saying that all kids need to be given that kind of education. I think that's one great uh, thing about what Keir has announced today. But to go back to what's the problem he's trying to address, I mean, I've got the figures in front of me. The, glass, the class ceiling exists. It, the di free school meals and non-free school meals children is one measure of poverty in the education system. If we start age five, Children on free school meals are doing about three quarters as well as does as their, their their peers. By the time of age 19, it's half. So your chances of getting two A levels if you're on free school meals are half those of if you're not on free school meals. You can't look at that and say that it is either socially just or economically functional, because what we're doing is we're wasting the human potential of perfectly decent people who deserve better, and Kia today is promising to them they will get better. Eva? Well, uh, what, what's happened um, since COVID? We've got teachers going on strike. They've, they've lost two more days of education, which is absolutely outrageous. Um, I'm, I'm really lucky. My mum was a teacher. So, you know, it was a vocation. And obviously the salaries are salaries, whatever they are. But if you're going to come in as a new teacher on 27 grand, that is not small beans, you know. And I think people need to really um, think about what is happening with those children. And if that really is the truth, and, and obviously you've got the fi figures, Paul, and I don't, but if that's really the truth, then what's actually happening in our education system, then maybe Ofsted need to look at that. Mm. But why isn't the government talking to teachers to try and to resolve these issues? They step back and think, oh, we'll see what happens. It's not good enough. Now, my husband was a teacher, mm. my sister was a teacher, <laughs> education runs our family. And for my parents, I was the first to go to university in my family. The big issue that my parents were insistent on was education, work hard at school, because that's the route. Mm. And this thing, I think, talking about language is really important. It's about confidence, so confidence to express yourself, uh, whether it's in a job interview, whether it's going shopping, whether it's meeting other people you've never met before. Those things are giving young people the confidence to get on in life. It's absolutely crucial. And but, it can't just be... In our schools it doesn't now. happen everywhere. There mm. are good pockets. It doesn't happen everywhere. And if children are losing out, there mm. is a duty, an obligation <clears throat> on government to do something about it. I have to say, I think what Keir has set out, because he gets it, because he understands it, it's his background as well, um, it's not just, oh, it's OK if some children achieve in grammar schools. It's throughout the education system. All children need to have the opportunity. Is there an issue, though, with asking schools to do yet more stuff? I mean, we're asking them to deal with a mental health crisis. We're asking them to deal with social yeah. problems, exactly. with training yeah. children how to eat yeah. food. Um, I think the director of uh, Ofsted, Amanda Spielman, said recently, schools are always the first lever I know. that you pull. Yeah. Can, yeah. They, can they cope with any more? I think what we need to do is look at the school curriculum, what's embedded in the curriculum just piling something new one thing after another doesn't work and it's wrong on teachers and it's wrong on the pupils as well and it's asking asking teachers to have expertise in so many different areas that they may not have but let's look at the curriculum let's see where the gaps are let's see if we can better support teachers so we don't have so many leaving the profession when they've got something so great to offer to their pupils mm. well, okay you made a very good point i think just to add quickly that uh, a lot we often try to use the education system as a plaster we throw into problems that are actually caused by many other things the break down of the family, all sorts of societal dysfunction. And unless we address those things, you're not going to educate children out of that problem. OK, all right. Well, we're going to leave that there and move on now and talk about a story which has broken in the last hour or so. Former Chief Whip Chris Pincher is facing an eight-week ban from Parliament following allegations of groping. We can speak now to our correspondent, Leila Nathu. Um, hi, Leila. Um, just fill us in on what this report published this morning says. Morning, Lizzie. Well, yeah, this is a long-awaited parliamentary report into allegations of sexual harassment uh, against Chris Pincher. You'll remember that it was Boris Johnson's handling of these allegations and his response to them that actually precipitated uh, his downfall last summer. So these allegations go back to la last summer, last June, uh, at, at an event at a private members club in Mayfair for Tory MPs, where Chris Pincher, who was then the government, uh, uh, the deputy chief whip in government, uh, was said to have grown 
throat to men. And this report by the Parliamentary Committee into Standards is not actually looking at those incidents themselves, although they do establish uh, what happened that evening, that they say Chris Pincher groped two individuals. They describe that physical contact as unwanted, upsetting, deeply inappropriate. They say Mr Pincher was drunk at the time of these events and they were witnessed uh, those incidents by a number of Conservative MPs. Now, the reason that the Parliamentary Committee is looking into this is because they are establishing whether, through these actions, uh, Chris Pincher brought Parliament into disrepute, so damaged the reputation of Parliament through that behaviour. They have decided today that actually it has, and they've recommended that he be suspended from Parliament for eight weeks. Now, that is a, a, a large sanction. It's a long suspension uh, in the scheme of things. They had the power uh, to suspend him. A 10-day suspension would have been enough to trigger uh, now what is called a recall petition paved the way for a by-election essentially but they have decided to recommend an eight-week suspension so quite a, a, a strong sanction there now what happens is that it's up to MPs will get a vote to approve this sanction that would then pave the way for a recall petition in his constituency of Tamworth uh, in Staffordshire then if constituents want a by-election they would get one he could contest that uh, so that is ultimately where the process could end up. Now, of course, we could see a resignation of Chris Pincher. Before that, he has already said that he is going to stand down as the MP for Tamworth at the next election. So we'll have to wait and see uh, whether he follows his close ally, Boris Johnson, uh, in doing the same, resigning before uh, getting those sanctions for a parliamentary committee. But yet another by-election headache for Rishi Sunak. Absolutely. Leila, thank you very much for that update. Uh, we really appreciate it. Heather, this is an absolute headache for Rishi Sunak, isn't it? You don't want another by-election. No, and hopefully the uh, good people of Tamworth don't want one either and so they won't get the 10% uh, they need on the um, petition. But, um, look, Chris is an old friend of mine and I'm not going to pile in on him. Um, he very quickly apologised. Um, he realises he's got issues with uh, alcohol and um, he said he's going to stand down at the next election and uh, I'm not going to pile in on top of that. You don't think there's a good chance that he, he may choose to resign? He doesn't have to. OK. Angela? I think one of the things that's made this carry on and on and on is Boris Johnson not taking action at the time. And I think when there is evidence before a Prime Minister, they have to look at that evidence, see what action they should take. And this is a bit, you know, the shades here, isn't there, of the previous case where in Paterson, where the Prime Minister Boris Johnson urged their MPs not to support the report. So I, I would have thought Richie Sunak probably had a very different line, I would hope, and say Parliament makes up his mind on these issues. Yeah, but it's, it's unedifying. House yeah, it's un House it, should, and it should have been last time as well. I think it's unedifying for Parliament on these things, but I think you have to put your trust in committees that look at things in detail. But I haven't read the report, but I think a lot hangs on that action wasn't taken when it could have been done to stop something like this happening. OK, all right, thank you. We're going to uh, move on and talk about banking now. Are banks closing accounts for political reasons? Uh, let's have a look at this headline, this BBC headline. Bank account closures probe must be fast-tracked, says Minister. Uh, this comes after the former UKIP leader, Nigel Farage, claimed his account uh, was shut for political reasons. And I think we can speak now to our business editor, Simon Jack, who's been following this story. Hello, Simon, good morning. Um, tell us about um, how this came about. So Nigel Farage last week um, posted a six minute video on Twitter saying that his bank uh, had threatened to close his account, asked him to move on. Uh, and uh, he said this was going to turn his life upside down. He was, wasn't sure whether he could continue to live and work in the UK and uh, said that it was uh, he was being ousted for purge, if you like, for political reasons. Now, it then emerged that the bank involved was Coots and a person familiar with that situation told me that the reason Nigel Farage was being uh, asked to close his account or having his account closed was commercial, not political. And they pointed me towards the uh, criteria for having a Coots account, which is very clear on their website. It caters for the very affluent. And it says you need to have either a million pounds borrowed from their bank or a million pounds in investments or have three million pounds in savings. And he doesn't deny, Nigel Farage, that he didn't hit that threshold. But what he does say is that he said that didn't seem to bother them for the last 10 years, which is how long he'd been a customer. Well, they did, he did also confirm that he'd, off, he'd paid off his mortgage early uh, not long ago. So the depth of that financial relationship with Coots um, was much less and less profitable for the bank. And um, talking to other bankers, they say, look, you know, any bank can 
and get rid of anyone at any time. There's no um, contractual obligation to continue to provide service, and that's in the terms and conditions. And uh, they looked at this situation and said, probably is that after a while, um, it probably wasn't profitable enough for them to continue offering the account. However, a lot of people got in touch with me saying, I've been a Coots uh, customer for many, many years. I've never had that much money. And so there clearly is discretion that they uh, can use. Some of those people may have family members who have substantial financial relationships. But um, NatWest were adamant it was for commercial, not political reason. And they offered him a NatWest account, well, that which actually owns Coots. Nigel Farage says they only offered that when he threatened to make a fuss and go public with his problems. OK. So aside from the specifics of the Farage case, are there issues here about how banks treat political figures? Because there are rules, aren't there, about how the banks have to oversee these accounts. So is there some failing going on with that mechanism? Well, there's clearly it is very non... It is not very transparent at all. You can have something called a PEP, a politically exposed person, um, because of the nature of their role or profile. Uh, the regulators and banks think they need extra scrutiny because they may be more influenced, foreign influenced, or more, more susceptible to bribery and corruption. So they do have a label, a PEP. Now, um, NatWest and Coots uh, weren't clear whether Nigel Farage fell into that category. He says that other banks told him that he did. But again, I was talking to another bank uh, not, not connected with the Farage case and said, listen, we've got hundreds, if not thousands, of politically exposed persons. They do need a little bit of extra scrutiny. That does take, come with an additional cost, but it's not a preclusion to having an account. But I think it is true to say that the non-transparency of the process of how these things are processed and how they are looked at by individual banks is a pretty murky. And so I'm not, not surprised to see Andrew Griffith, the Economic Secretary to the Treasury, saying we need have a look at this because the last thing we want, I think we all agree, we don't want banks to be political or moral arbiters. Okay, Simon Jack, our business editor, thank you very much for that explanation. Constantin, I understand you recently had a situation where a bank account was closed in relation to your podcast, is mm. that right? That is right. And uh, I'm not the only person in the wake of what Nigel came out with. There's been uh, Christina Jordan, who I think is a former MEP. Uh, I think there was a, a vicar of someone who commented on, on um, the Yorkshire Building Society, I think it was, and he made a comment about their trans inclusion policy or whatever. They immediately cancelled the bank account. And in our case, we run a podcast, we interview people from all over the political spectrum, and we received a message from uh, a bank which is tied, telling us our account was going to be closed with absolutely no explanation. It was only when we kicked, that kicked up a big fuss on social media, it got into the main, mainstream media, that they actually explained to us that the reason that they were uh, closing our account is that we accept donations. And this speaks very much to the case you've just been covering, where it seems to be a case of selective enforcement of carefully chosen rules that aren't applied to everyone else. We cannot be the only company in the country so that accepts donations. You you think it was, it would definitely was know. a political... No, no, I definitely don't think that because what I think we need is a proper investigation. We need to find out what's actually going on. I don't think anybody wants to be throwing around the idea that people are being discriminated against by banks for their political views. But there is the perception that's happening, and because of that, we really have to get to the bottom of it. OK, well, I have to read now a statement from your <laughs> bank, Tide, uh, which says to allege that, that uh, the closure of this account was in any way linked to the members' beliefs is categorically false and is an attempt to spread disinformation. Oh. As we have repeatedly stated to Mr Kissin in our communications with him, decisions at Tide are made on the basis of company policies and procedures and have no connection whatsoever with the members' beliefs. We, are, we uh, reiterate that every Tide member is treated equally, regardless of belief religion, race or any other characteristic protected So let me law. very quickly take the opportunity then. Can Tide then confirm that they have closed the bank account of every single company that accepts donations that they currently have a bank account with? I think you might need to have that well, uh, quite. conversation so, so with Unless them. they're willing to confirm that, they're clearly the ones spreading the misinformation. This is, this is a complete red herring. If the, your bank account was no, closed, no, probably wouldn't be a red herring no, for no, you. This is, it's a complete red herring. What's happening is that there are international rules on money laundering. And whether we, whether we have an inquiry into them or whether you have a bank account that you, with a bank that you don't like, those rules won't change. Those rules are there to protect us and to protect shareholders of banks against people who end up money laundering. Now, politically exposed people, there's a lot of them. There's two around this table. <laughs> um, uh, there's a lot of them. Banks must assure themselves that their sources of fund and wealth are real. 
So we don't know what the situation is with, with Farage, but one of the things banks have to do is they have to take account of what the news flow is around that person. Now, rightly or wrongly, a Labour backbencher accused Nigel Farage of taking half a million pounds from the Russian government. Whether that's and Farage denies it, whether it's true or not, the bank has to take account of it and then just has to say, well, are we running a risk that we don't want to run? And that's really all that's going on. Uh, probably the same thing with you. You I'm probably not the same. Politically exposed. Person. Well, so how is that happening with me? We, we don't. We don't know. I don't know your personal case. So you just but said we, it's but, probably happening with me, but yeah, you don't but the, know. but the bank. Yeah, the, they're taking a principal decision about the risks how that do you they're know? running. You have well, no idea. How I do. Know, I do because I understand banking regulations. It's there in black and white. They have to follow their own regulations. This is such an interesting transformation that's happened to people like you on the left. People the left, like me. The, the, the oh, left. Like the me, left too. used to be about protecting oh. the ordinary person from big corporations <laughs> and big government and all of this stuff. That's what you used to believe in. And here you are. You're sitting. And defending a banking corporation, I'm defending having no idea law. why they made the decision. I'm defending that they made. international banking regulation and law. Well, it's a great cause that is there to protect you and me from scammers and money launderers. I can just tell you, I don't feel very protected right now. Let's Take let's hear from bank. our let's hear from our politically exposed <laughs> persons. Um, actually, you would come in there, I think. Well, yes, we had a debate on this recently in the House of Lords, and I'm I'm quite surprised it's taken Andrew Griffiths so long because Paul's absolutely right. You have to have these rules and regulations in place. It protects the organisations. It protects us as individuals. But I think the Financial Conduct Authority's guidelines haven't always been followed. So it's followed, it's come, you know, the regulations I'm not quibbling about at all. I am following about some of the implementations. I know a number of people have had six page questionnaires about their financial circumstances when they're actually they're not wealthy people, but they're politically exposed. Now, a lot of people don't have a problem replying to those, but I think they just need to look at the guidelines of how it's been implemented. I haven't, you know, little sympathy for Nigel Farage, who's got to go to NatWest like the rest of us. So shame, you know, my, my crocodile tears are sort of pouring from my face here. But I do think, you know, that the rules and regulations have to be in place, but they have to be implemented. Are they being implemented correctly? There are also people sometimes on very low incomes who can't get bank accounts, and I'm really concerned for them, and that's an issue I think it concerns me a bit more than Nigel Farage not having to go to NatWest rather than Coots. OK. Heather, do you think this is a case of the banks being overtly political or maybe they're just being overcautious? They're being super cautious and totally incorrect, um, misleading, not misleading, misreading how <clears throat> the Financial Conduct Authority um, ought to be setting out the guidelines. About 10 days ago, we voted to change uh, the PEP rules affecting uh, British um, exposed persons. Um, I've had two bank accounts closed. Uh, when my brother dealing with the um, uh, closing of bank accounts of my father, who was a civil servant, 17 questions, goodness knows how many phone calls. It was a civil servant, but because I'm his daughter, um, it was an absolute nightmare dealing That's with it. That's the guidelines it. on how... It's, it's not just the regulations, wrong. Yeah. it's the guidelines I mean, on how some banks Fortunately, um, Sir Charles Walker has um, got a, a, a set letter that you can send back to your bank to say, you are reading the guidelines completely incorrectly and this is just not appropriate. And now we've had to legislate for it. Yeah. But, I mean, Paul, you said that this, this is to protect all of us. Yeah. Um, but is there a chance that in some of these cases the banks are simply saying, this is too complicated, it might be a bit risky, so we're just going to close these accounts? And, and that would be, seem to be a misapplication of the rules. Well, I don't know whether it is, uh, because, A, as you say, it's non-transparent. But they, do, they make those kind of decisions with regard to small businesses every day, let alone PEPs. They, banks have a risk portfolio and some of it's got to be safe investment and some of it's got to be risky investment. And they look at the portfolio and they, so they, they could just as... Le it, there could be a general aversion to PEP P P risk going on in the British banking system. And I think that would be a legitimate uh, kind of line of inquiry for, 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 for Parliament. The transparency it might be that, that, that their, their mm -hmm. aversion to risk is driving them away from, from, from exposed people, in which case you're going to need a solution to but that. But I think the important point here is that this isn't just happening to the so-called exposed people. You made the point this is happening to a lot of people on very low incomes, and that's one of the points I've been came to emphasise throughout this whole thing. My podcast has a million subscribers across different platforms. I can go out and get attention for this in the media. So can Nigel Farage. If you're someone who earns 20 grand and you said the wrong thing somewhere that someone didn't like and they closed your account, what are you going to do? Oh, that was, and so this that wasn't is what, the point I was making. The but it's the point I'm making, yeah, but, no, but you said, with you respect. You it to what I said. The point I'm making is that there are people on low incomes that are trying to get access to financial services. Yes. 
is really hard. And I'd like to see the banks do a little bit more than, than that Fine. on that. And that's really comes back to what Keir Starmer has been saying about access to all kinds of services for people on lower incomes. My, uh, fine. My point is, I think it's very unwise and short term is for people to say, well, as long as it's happening to Nigel Farage, this is OK. And I would remind you, whatever you personally may feel about Nigel Farage, I voted Remain in the Brexit referendum. Nigel Farage represents a hell of a lot of people in this country, and he represents so many people that he's this never been elected. Doesn't, there's not <laughs> so really many people love him that he's never single. He's never won he represents a single a hell of a lot more people than you. Paul, Let them stand me. for Parliament. Not that I particularly share Let his views. Let them stand for Parliament. That isn't my point. My point Sorry. is, this is not about some wack wacko on the far end of the political spectrum having their bank account closed. This is someone who has a mainstream view uh, in this country, and this is completely unacceptable to be happening to someone. Is there a problem though that it took a, a public figure like Nigel Farage making a hoo-ha about this for it to kind of get any attention. I, 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 the irony of this is quite something. Literally 10 days ago, we changed the law. And it's going through Parliament now. So actually, we changed the law before Farage. Do you think Nigel Farage um, was paying attention to the, to well, the legislation? Probably, uh, a, a number yeah. of people were not paying attention well, to well, it. The ministers, but I'm delighted we changed the law. Well, I'm a bit disappointed though. If all these things going on, the minister says he wants to have a review after Nigel Farage. The minister should have been listening to people. No, no, no. The issue what? of transparency. No, sorry, Heather. Uh, Paul mentioned about transparency. We're not criticising regulations to protect people. They have to be in place. But if implementation is overzealous on some people and not others, and I say it isn't about Nigel Farage and big banks, it's about everybody, and it's about making sure the guidelines are followed properly and are transparent for everybody. Yeah. No, um, the reason why Andrew particularly has taken this stance is he hadn't heard the stories of the uh, MPs. He's I the mean, minister. So, no, 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 because that happened about two years ago, three years ago. It's been all the yeah, time. Yeah, well, so, I mean, you know, when Craig, Mc Craig McKinley's father at 86... Was told he, he was bank accounts was going to be closed. Well, the minister because, has to wait I mean, to hear that. In, no, no, well, it, you know, the, the tea room is a great place, Angela, and, and things come out of it in the Finger tea room. Finger on the okay. pulse. All right, we're going to move on and talk about migration, but Constantine mentioned his uh, podcast. Uh, so before we move on, a reminder that you can catch up with Politics Live on the BBC iPlayer, and you can also now find us on BBC Sounds every day. We're publishing each programme as a podcast. Uh, very handy if you are on the move or want to listen to something after you've listened to Constantine's podcast. Mm -hmm. Right, as I said, moving on to the government's illegal migration bill, let's take a look at the front page of today's Daily Express. Lords must not defy the will of the people. Uh, we can see there the government last night uh, defeated again in the House of Lords. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, bringing forward another amendment on the legislation that he says is morally unacceptable. Let's have a listen to what he had to say now. The UK has led in the past, historically, and it does so now. I want to stress this amendment does not wreck or damage the bill or indeed set intentions for the government to follow. It is indeed intended to be helpful to improve the bill by mitigating some of the concerns about a lack of a global and long-term perspective on the issues and to offer something around which this House and the other place could debate carefully and thoughtfully, <coughs> whatever our differing views about the rest of the bill. OK, the Archbishop of Canterbury there, uh, Justin Welby. Um, Angela, are the Lords defying the will of the people? No, I think this is, this is a difficult bill. I have to say it's unusual to have so many amendments, but I think you know, we had an um, immigration bill a year ago that was going to solve the problems. Then we've got another immigration bill. I think I'm always slightly sceptical about the will of the people because there are lots of people who have different views. But I think everybody wants to stop these small boats coming across the channel, people putting their lives at risk, their families' lives at risk. This bill doesn't do that. And the very first speech the Archbishop of Canterbury made, for example, was to say... You know, if the bill was to do that, we'd all support it. It doesn't do that. The amendments are pretty moderate, I have to say. But what the what last night's one was particularly interesting, what he's saying is you can't just keep having bill after bill after bill. You've got to look at this internationally, holistically across government departments, and let's have a strategy that goes over a number of years so we can address the problems. Even if this bill's a raging success, that's what we have to do. What was interesting is how few, you know, Tories voted against it. The government said, we're against this. We can't possibly have a strategy. We should do it year by year and ad hoc. 
only 100, I think something, 130 something to, yeah, um, I think, I peers I think it was turned up. Yeah. There's over 270. They stayed at home. They didn't bother to vote. Heather, Even they're not convinced. Heather, is this amendment unreasonable? I mean, it, the one last night that Justin Welby put forward is essentially the government should have a 10 year plan and work with other governments. Or any government should have a 10 year plan. Or any, any government should have a 10 year plan. You know. I think the difficulty is that um, it's another opportunity to try and kick a really important bill into oh, the long grass. Doesn't. Well, well, it, it does. It, it, it's holding everything up. No, I mean, doesn't. we, you know, how little time, how many few days there are before recess. I mean, this is. And I also know the, the House of Commons goes home sometimes at three o'clock, four o'clock, or five o'clock in the afternoon, and we're still sitting till midnight. Well, and later. The, the business managers are having to deal with that. There is there is this backlog of stuff in the Lords. Having um, debating this in the Lords for seven days when we got it. Done in three. I mean, it's ridiculous. It says more about the Commons and the Lords, I have well, to say. Well, it does. It says that we're getting on with the job. It says you're not looking at it in detail. Mo only one of the big amendments that was voted on has actually been put forward by the Labour front bench. Alf Dubbs did one on unaccompanied children, Ruth Lister on pregnant women. Conservative MP has been putting forward amendments to be voted on. Crossbenchers have. Um, bishops have. Lib Democrats have. What this bill has done is people in the Lords, you look at something in detail. Will this work? Will it won't work? What's sensible? What's reasonable? And across all the parties, there's been a consensus. There's a lot wrong with this bill. And if we want to tackle this, our particular amendment is on tackling the smuggling gangs. They're making huge profit out of you know, misery of people trying to leave their countries. That's the first port of call. That's what you have to tackle. This bill, we, what will end up, we'll have another bill in another year's time, then one after if the government carried on like this. Heather, do you want to come back Well, in I'm then? obviously very grateful that uh, the year after and the year after it's going to be a Conservative we government. On like this, so we well won't. done, Angela. But um, the, uh, the difference is that um, uh, Pritchard Patel made a really good speech and it laid out all the differences of the attack points of going after. The, the criminal groups. So that is actually happening now. So, oh, well, no, so why, there's been well, huge they increased, amounts then? of, of, of the, the money going to France, um, looking at um, attacking and the, the numbers the are going points. up, it's not working. Well, it is the summer, dear. Constantine, do you see this as the House of Lords just doing its job? Well, I th let's come back. And by the way, I say this with all possible respect, but if I was an ordinary person watching this sort of in political squabble, I, I would think that the will of the people is being ignored. Uh, I came to this country in 1995. I'm a first generation immigrant here. When I came here in 95, 96, 3% of the British public thought that an Im immigration was a major issue. Uh, it's very, very much higher now, and that's because we've had a very large wave of immigration. I think between 97 and today, we've had more immigration than we had since the Battle of Hastings. So we've had large levels of immigration, and now, of course, we're seeing, as you say, people coming uh, across the channel uh, legal, illegally risking their lives. I think uh, the ordinary person is very frustrated about this, and British people have voted consistently. Whether I or you may agree with them or not, they've voted very consistently for parties and and uh, campaigns that represent a reduction in immigration and then end to illegal immigration. The fact that it's not happening, I think, will be very frustrating to a lot of Paul, people. Paul, are the people being frustrated? There's no such thing as illegal immigration, number one. What do you mean? It's, it's, it's not a concept. It's, there's no such thing as illegal immigration, but that's not the point. Um, in the British Constitution, we have one, uh, you know, formulated by you know, people like Dicey in the 19th century. And Dicey says, there is no will of the people other than that which is, which is expressed by the sovereign in Parliament. So, the, so Parliament, ultimately, that is the Lords and the Commons, and the, the royal assent beyond it, ultimately expresses what the will of the people is. It's not possible for Parliament to be not expressing the will of the people in our constitution. That is what you sign up for when you, when you Although, migrate Paul, to this. Although, elected have... Lords. Yeah, absolutely. Are the will of the people, uh, yeah, are they? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah just, just to be clear, that's our constitution. Okay. The will of the people is Parliament. Now, it's also possible for Parliament, by expressing the will of the people, to break international law. And if it does, and I think it will when it passes this, this law, if unamended, then it, can't, then it will go to the Supreme Court and it can go to the Euro European Court of Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights can overrule our sovereignty. That's the situation every, every GCSE politics student knows. It's not an effete discussion. So uh, whether the people headlines, when do we get them? We get them when right-wing populism is trying to mobilise popular discontent against our democracy. Can I just come back on this idea that there's no such thing as illegal immigration? Um, my mother applied for a visa to come and visit uh, my wife and our newborn child, and she was denied for various reasons she couldn't come. So there are people who get in a boat in France 
come to this country uh, and we put them up in a hotel when people who apply through the proper system are denied a visa and can't come. Do you think that there's anyone in this country that thinks that is reasonable, fair or legal? I think Do you think there's anybody who thinks yeah. that's the I right way to really administer this? It's really interesting you say that your mother wasn't given the visa. Yeah. And that's one of the big problems here, that the legal routes for people to come to this country are inadequate at the moment, whether they're visiting family, whether it's about work or whatever, they're inadequate. That has to be looked at. And one of the issues that were amendments to the bill, I think a couple put by Conservative um, peer, was about having safe and legal routes for people to come to this country. Others about pregnant women, others about detaining children, one about determining the age of children, and about international law. What the law has done is looked at very moderate changes, not the basic premise of the bill, because everybody agrees you want to stop small boats. But if you put measures forward that don't do that, there's an obligation and a duty on the second chamber to look at the details of the legislation. And I think those kind of debates, anyone who listened to that debate last night, even people who supported the government in other um, votes voted for that government, um, Justin Welby's amendment, or stayed away. Because the sense that you have to have a longer term way of doing this, rather than the sort of annual immigration bill where the government gets it wrong, so it brings something forward again, doesn't work for anybody, doesn't work for immigrants, doesn't work for the will of the people, and doesn't work for Parliament. You have to do these things sensibly and properly, and that isn't what this bill does. It's a real shame, because there is an opportunity to do something serious about these illegal people. Well, I say illegal in the sense <laughs> that they're criminal gangs yeah. if you look at everybody else, but do something about this. There's a real opportunity to deal with it properly, and the government is more interested in rhetoric than addressing the problem. OK, well, I think the battle between the Commons and the Lords is likely uh, to run on. Um, just to let you know, uh, our on-air times for next week are slightly different than normal because of Wimbledon, you may have noticed. We'll be on at 10.15 on Monday on BBC Two and iPlayer, 11.45 on Tuesday and on Thursday at 11.15. Uh, our normal time for Wednesday's Politics Live because of Prime Minister's questions. I'm sure you have now committed all of those uh, times to your diary. Uh, there you go. All right, finally, we are going to um, talk about Bidenomics uh, now. Let's show a clip of the American President, uh, Joe Biden. When I took office, the pandemic was raging and our economy was reeling. Supply chains were broken, millions of people unemployed. Hundreds of thousands of small businesses on the verge of closing after so many had already closed. Literally hundreds of thousands on the verge of closing. Today, the U.S. has the highest economic growth rate leading the world economies since the pandemic. The highest in the world. American President Joe Biden there, of course. Now, Paul, uh, who I've got, we have with us today, has written a piece in The New European that is highly complimentary of Bidenomics and calls on Labour to adopt uh, some of those policies. Let's have a look at that headline now. It says, we need an economic regime change. This six-point plan would help bring it. Once there is a mandate, Labour needs to sign up as many people as possible of Europe's own Bidenomics projects. Now, Paul, if I could appeal to you, don't give us the entire I six won't. points. <laughs> <There's no time. laughs> but, um, could, you give us, could you give us an approximation Look, of what Bidenomics means? Bidenomics is very simple. It's carrot and stick to, to force the onshoring, so bringing back to America, of business investment. And it involves things like um, banning American firms from, from doing semiconductor business with, with China, at the same time as incentivizing investment into green energy and transport and infrastructure on a scale far bigger than our own austerity-addicted Treasury has been doing. And the result is not just good for America. The problem is it's, it's sucking investment from all over the world, including here, including startups here, over to America. So I don't think we have a choice but to do state-led green investment here in this country, even to just stay level with where the Americans are going to but be in five isn't, years isn't that the, the Labour plan? Should, should Labour get into government? That's it, the plan already, isn't it? 28 it is, it, billion it is. on For green. example, today's education thing is part of it. Skills will be a massive shortage. America doesn't have skills shortages because it's got green cards. It just brings people in to, to do those jobs. But what Labour hasn't faced yet is the institutional changes we're going to need. I think we have a 2% inflation charge target that is strangling the economy. We have an Office for Budget Responsibility. Liz Truss said this. That has the wrong understanding of the way investment works. Until we change these big institutions, Labour's plans won't be executed. Well, you mentioned Liz Truss, but isn't the lesson of the Liz Truss quasi-quartang budget that you kind of 
mess with the Treasury orthodoxy at your absolute peril? Because it didn't go very well, did Joe it? Joe Biden has a Treasury. Uh, Joe Biden has a, a, has a central bank and he has a Treasury and it hasn't stopped him making the biggest, probably the biggest since the 60s, state-led investment uh, uh, initiative that has revived his economy. The point is, you, you, we, we're going to need to change the orthodoxy. The, I mean, it is nerdy, but the OBR doesn't recognise that if you invest a pound long term, it can produce a pound's worth of long term growth. It just doesn't have a model that says that. We have to change that. Yeah. A Angela, is there a danger because of the economic situation that we find ourselves in that Labour is kind of reneging on some of its spending pledges and that? Uh, the next Labour government, if it is indeed a Labour government, will find itself very constrained by the kind of orthodoxy that Paul is talking about. I think the economic situation is going to make it harder. And if you look at some things we're looking to do, it's not changing where we want to be, but the timescale to achieve it and the rate we can put in that investment has had to lengthen. That's a real problem. And I think we recognise that. And I think Rachel's been quite clear. She uses the term securonomics, which... Uh, basically being up security and she's been quite clear that day-to-day -day spending is you know you pay as you go in effect but where it is and it's similar to biden economics that where you're looking for long-term growth and investment that's the only reason you can borrow and i think it's really interesting the other great similarity which is completely different to where we are at the moment is the role of the state. It's state-led investments. The state is working with investors to say, what are the skills you need for these jobs? What are the jobs of tomorrow? Where's the green growth going to be? And how do we as a state ensure that we've got the right skills, the right apprenticeships, the right education system to deliver that? Mm -hmm. So it's linking it all together, but it is looking forward. And it is saying that the state has not a passive role to sit back and say, what's happening? It's got to be an active role of the state. Heather? Well, I'm a great believer in the free ports. And what's happening at Teesside is absolutely astonishing. The green growth there is fabulous. And, and the new hydrogen hub that's going to be built up there, all of that is led by not just state investment, but, you know, state encouragement and, and bringing um, private enterprise in and working together. So, and, and particularly um, working on the uh, job, not just the jobs, but the education side of it as well. So knowing what um, future training is going to be needed. And so, you know, now there's quite a big discussion about the apprenticeship levy and whether it work, it's working or it's not working. But actually, all of a sudden, the growth is there. And I'm, I'm, I'm very positive about all that. Constantine, do you think the state should be more involved? I think the state can be involved very effectively. But, you know, I run a small business now with my YouTube show. We probably employ between 10 and 12 people at different times. And one of the things I know is we would be hiring more people right now if it wasn't for the fact that our tax burden is going up all the time. OK. So, uh, it, it, you know, the I, people I, who know how to invest are usually the people okay. running I just, I just want to stop you there because we've got some pictures coming in from Keir Starmer's mm. speech uh, this morning in Gillingham. Oh, it's, it, yeah, it's a clip, I think. If we can play that now, let's listen. And insecurity is the enemy of opportunity. It places barriers. Not just, e not just economic barriers. Pledge, reinstate your pledge for 28 billion per year. I did my, I, on the mission on uh, green if power. We did that last pledges, one. We've so done that terms. one. Will you just... Which side are the Labour Party on? We are on the side of economic growth. Will you just let me please get on with this? Thank you very much. Stop making new turns here. We have already... Okay. Will you just let me finish this and I'll come and talk to you about it? Keir Starmer there, clearly. Some people not happy with changes to his plans on spending. Thank you to my guests. That's all we have time for today. Politics Live is back on Monday, 10.15.